when there was a lot of attention bottom, it usually swung more in EDG's way. Whoa, and EDG really changing up their draft this time around as well on the blue side. Elise is still going to be the ban, but Aurelian Soul and Zyra are going to leave the rift. No more plant situation down there towards the bottom lane, and I do like it. Yeah, Zyra's awesome. fairly telling for the draft. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of counter picks that Zyra's really good for. Uh, one of it's Caitlyn. Caitlyn's really oppressive in lane, but she kind of struggles against Zyra, and banning Zyra kind of just cements that Caitlyn will be able to do her job and just bully the lane. Yeah, Although, it was... it's going to be first picked by EDG. Well, yeah, yeah that was, that's the point. Yeah, that was so you plan. banned the Zyra, so you picked the Caitlyn. All right, okay, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, it's also kind of telling that they banned the Aurelian Soul as well. After seeing success with it, uh, their plan is clearly to get a strong bot lane again for Deft, and they can't risk giving away the Aurelian Soul. Uh, one of Kuro's best champions, so I think it makes sense to see them ban it away here so they don't have to risk the Caitlyn trade for the Aurelian Soul. Yeah, it kind of feels really obvious what EDG likes to draft, just by telling by the bans. From game two, the one that I commentated a little bit ago, uh, they ended up banning Jace and first, pinning, uh, first picking Kennen. So it's more about the players just telling the coach, hey, I need this pick, make sure you get me this pick, and they just kind of cater the draft towards that. So this time, Def's like, yo, I need Caitlyn, I'll carry this game, give me Caitlyn. Well, we'll see whether he can do that as this makes a heck of a lot of sense out of Clear Love and Scout. Of course, Clear Love has one of the most absurd all-time KDAs on Lee Sin out of any player I've ever witnessed in my life. It's somewhere around 10 after <laughs> so, so many games. Not in China right now, though. He's been struggling a little bit more at the World Championships. Most certainly has, but he hasn't played Lee Sin yet. Oh, he's going to be playing this game, so we'll see how good it is. The Nami also makes sense, trying to pick the strongest lane possible. Nami probably being the best pick for that after the Karma was taken away. Yeah, yeah Nami is for sure the best 2v2 laner, um, I'd say after Karma, but for in terms of just lane stability, Nami is the best, just for the amount of poke and sustain and utility. And also like the Lee Sin pick here, uh, from before, Olaf and Hecarim, not Claire Love's best champions, and <laughs> I'm hoping the Lee Sin will really... Uh, really add to their early game sort of prowess that they can bring to the bot side. So if they get really good trades bot side, they have more sustain. So I highly doubt that EDG ends up getting shoved in. And if they get the gank set up, then I think that's a real win, uh, good win condition for EDG to just snowball through the bot side. Yeah, and EDG have actually saved their solo lanes for the last couple of picks here as well. So not showing their hand too early on, which they have been prone to do throughout the drafting phase. Jace, of course, still available is a big deal. Rock's holding on to that pick for Smeb so they can get the counter that they want. Oh. And that would be interesting. Right, because I was going to say, it's really scary to take the the rumble because of how, how strong the Jace is. And we saw that in game one, basically. Yeah. So if they take both here, I would be really impressed by it. Assuming they can play it, of course, because it, it not only denies uh, the pick away from Smeb and it protects your rumble, and obviously I don't think they trust Korra 1 to just play the Jace, so this is a, a really smart pick if they go for it. Yeah, really good draft strategy. Being able to take away one of the only counter picks for the, the top lane, it actually forces the cannon pick to come out, and comp-wise, I don't really uh, enjoy Rox's double AP comp. Uh, it's sort of just they have to flank in, otherwise their team fight's actually really weak. And for EDG, having the two strong power pick, uh, actually, I, it's really only the one power pick of Jace, but having the Rumble and the Lee Sin, there's a lot of early game potential for the mid and bot side, and I'm really liking EDG's chances for with this draft. Yeah, I also really like the fact that they have Jace now in the mid lane. They have Clear Love on a mannerless jungler. That is going to be early blue buffs for the Jace. You'll be able to throw those shock blasts all over that mid lane. Peanut not going to have as much of a way in if Koro doesn't have any health bars, and especially if the minion wave is going to go missing. It's one of the first times where I feel like we can definitely give EDG some props for their draft phase, which honestly, even in the last game, wasn't something that we were saying is genius. It was more rocks picking Fiora when they probably shouldn't have. The one thing I'll say about uh, the draft that EG took, it is very smart in terms of securing themselves strong soul laners and being safe in them. It is a hard comp to play. We've seen a number of teams pick this kind of like one tank, squishy everything else, and Lee Sin is not like the most stable tank. It's not like a Rek'Sai or a Zac or something else. So we've seen a number of teams fail at this style of comp before, so it's going to be really big if EDG can pull it off because the flex Jace pick is so important. If they win this game going to game five, it's super scary. Yeah, the difficulty of this draft is pretty hard for EDG, but overall the strength I think is really good because there's a lot of objective control. Having a Jace and a Rumble really cements. Basically, if any CC lands, there goes half of the HP for any team trying to contest them. So I really like EDG's comp if they can get ahead and keep contesting objectives because they have a really strong uh, 
objective contesting team. Well, we'll see whether they can make it work as we are under the rift for game number four. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, chime in on Twitter. Use that hashtag AskTheCasters and your question bec could become a part of the show. Of course, immortalized for all eternity in the realm of VODs. Yeah, so a little bit of pre-laning analysis. You can note that Gorilla has Ignite, Mako has Exhaust. It's really important to note what summoner there is for the kind of all-ins that happen because the all-in dynamic really changes when you have Ignite over at Exhaust, because Ignite, you can pretty much just target whichever, and as long as they don't have another Ignite, you can just sort of focus the same champion and go for the kill. But with Exhaust, you don't really have that luxury since the heal, uh, being able to just Exhaust and heal run away is much more, uh, basically a good strategy to just play more passive and just use Exhaust and heal to back off of any sort of potential all-ins. I actually have double of Exhaust as well, as uh, Scout has decided to take that into Korra. Of course, we did see Exhaust being a favorable option against, you know, the Rises of old, but now still wants it there in the mid lane to avoid uh, that all-in potential. Would you say that the, the Ignite was chosen because they would want to play more aggressive and, and go for kills, or because it was against the Nami who has the sustain and the, the healing can... Uh, generally, for Ignite, it's basically whether or not they need Exhaust. And looking at the enemy team comp, there's no real uh, real threat of Assassins. Like, Jace always kind of sits back in team fights. Rumble sits back. Lee Sin uh, goes for the Insects, but Exhaust doesn't really slow him down since it's all jumps. And it's not really the damage that they're looking to mitigate with Exhaust. So, for this, uh, it's more of like a luxury that Gorilla is able to take Ignite. No cannon to worry about, like we see EDG taking two exhaust for. Yeah. Would make some sense there as Mako gets the dream double ebb and flow down towards the bottom side of the map. Rock's getting a good quick shove. It's actually really important for the trading. The way uh, Nami has to trade in this lane is by getting uh, either the double or basically never allowing her AD carry to get below uh, any sort of HP. So when the AD carry is full HP, Mako can freely use W whenever she wants uh, going forward. Well, well, whenever he wants. Then. Yeah. And actually, when you're playing Nami as well, Matt, do you like to self-cast the ebb and flow to try and uh, get the extra healing, or do you like to, you know, enemy cast the ebb and flow to try and get extra damage? It's good to note, yeah, the healing increases on the first uh, use of it. So self-healing, when you're trading and you know it's uh, basically impossible to get a third bounce, then it's good for that regard. Sometimes it's good when the AD carry is in range. You can heal yourself and the AD carry with the same W, but... Uh, it's, it's really just about understanding how the W works and for this what situation comes up. It's like here, if Def was in range and you self-casted your W, it's actually more worth it since it'll bounce to your AD carry. I like it. Always wondered, uh, whilst playing Nami, what the best ebbing and flowing options are. <laughs> yeah, this lane's actually really good for Def right now. He has the lane pushing into him, and uh, Nami's training is really good here. So Prey is being really cautious. He's cautious of any sort of gank happening. And he's really cautious going for uh, the really aggressive traits. Because for Jin, he's actually allowed to go really aggressive for the fourth bullet and be able to take any return poke, simply because he deals more damage with the fourth bullet. So here, you don't really see him going for the fourth, fourth bullet for ass. Similar to how Kaelin, with his headshot, doesn't uh, go forward in all the land. Are you expecting uh, much jungle attention for this matchup? Because uh, there are two kind of squishy lanes in, in both. Uh, top and mid, so are you, you, is this the kind of thing where you see that and you think, okay, the junglers early are going to be looking to impact those because there are a lot of like squishy, snowbally matchups, or do you think, it, you know, you always have to... Yeah, so for range matchups, even though they're pretty volatile, it's actually hard to set up the gank. Like, trying to communicate with your jungler, you have to communicate a few things like where the vision is, what the lanes, uh, the wave is looking like, whether it's put, being pushed in or pushed out, and communicating all that and setting up a gank is actually really hard to do because the volatility of bot lane is yeah, exactly that. It's too volatile to really predict what will happen in the next, you know, 30 uh, seconds to a minute. So coordinating your jungle to uh, get a good gank really just comes down to sort of like the planets aligning. Like the jungle has to end his route. The lane has to be in a good position for you. X amount of damage has to be taken from the enemy. You have to be able to walk up and get uh, enough CC on the enemies to be able to either get a summoner or get a kill. This is in contrast, of course, to something like a Braum or an Alistair where you can kind of W2 yeah, it's really easy. Like, for, yeah. Just like Alistar, if you have Alistar Flash and a Lee Sin, so let's sub out Alistar for the EDG, it's really easy to set up a gank. All you have to do is just have the lane on your side, say, hey, jungler, come down here now. All I have to do is flash, and at the very least, there'll be a trade of summoners, but usually if the enemy bot lane's playing too far up, a flash gank will usually result to a kill. Well, not going to be available here. Just to catch you back up on, on things that have been happening across the map, Peanut was able to invade and steal away the enemy blue buff, so I believe that was a three buff start for the Olaf. However, 
Clear Love was still able to invade, managed to get a wolf camp. The wolf spirit, more importantly, as well as the Grom. So still going to be up as far as the experience is concerned. Yeah, so you can already start seeing a bit of a CS deficit for the rock spot lane. It'll sort of catch up with this uh, incoming wave, but still it'll probably be about a 5 CS lead uh, for Death. And it really comes from just having the Nami in lane, not being afraid to take any sort of trade on their side of the lane. So when the wave actually comes towards your side uh, with the sustain, then even if you take a bad trade, like if the Karma keys you, the Jin autos you, it's really just safe to be on your side and you keep sustaining, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, we actually saw Deft soak some uh, some of the Deadly Flourishes just so that he could deny CS as well, understanding that he does have yeah, that right now, Pei's just losing all of his HP, and this is where the pressure comes in, having more sustain, having uh, the pressure. So instead of holding the wave on their side, EDG plans on just keep pushing, keep pressuring, because eventually Prey's going to have to recall. Sad thing is, on the far side of the map, uh, Koro is kind of getting pushed in really hard by the cannon, and you saw the Lee Sin sitting behind there getting ready to, to absorb a gank. There's a dive coming. It would be nice if they could get their own kind of pressure from the Lee Sin, but they're doing well enough in the 2v2 that they don't need to call down for it and set up some kind of dive or anything. Uh, and one thing about EG's comp, which uh, I'm not a big fan of, is that their dives aren't super good. Uh, I mean, the, the Rumble's really good, at, but the Jace doesn't add a lot compared to a Rise who can actually lock someone down and set the team up for extra damage. So uh, Rocks do have a little bit of advantage if they're forcing bot roams really hard. Well, let's see whether they are actually going to do that, because at the moment Rocks do have that lead on the top side, equaled by the lead on the bottom side of the map for EDG. So the gold is entirely evened out. And it feels like this matchup has done something very similar as far as how this game feels on the outset. It felt in games, especially game two, that Rocks just had a flat out advantage absolutely everywhere. But this time, really feeling like Rocks are feeling some of the pressure. It mostly came down to the matchup. Uh, for Jin and Karma to win this lane, it really comes down to the EDG bot lane messing up. Because if they play uh, pretty much optimally, there's no real way for them to get uh, punished for this sort of matchup. Just Kane Lanami is too strong at uh, being able to have the held, uh, have the wave held onto them and gaining the advantage once the wave is pushing back up. Because they can hard shove, they can poke on the wave, and they can out sustain. So it really just came down to Rocks either having to play extremely well by punishing every little mistake, or as you've seen, they just try to mitigate any sort of advantage. And overall, they're not too far behind, especially in a matchup where uh, the Kalen has to get a BF sword, and Prey doesn't have to get a BF sword. He can get, uh, you know, the smaller uh, items. So having that, you know, um, sorry, serrated Dirk and yep. Long Sword, he's not too far behind an item. So it's actually not bad for Prey right now. We'll see whether they can utilize this. The wave is currently pushing forward. Looks a bit juicy there for Death, but he takes a Mantra Q. Gorilla now with his Sight Stone completed. Not any extra damage or anything like that, but it just felt like it hit for quite a lot. Death looking for some Tide Caller's blessings onto both Prey and Gorilla. Yeah, here the Rock Spellin has to be looking for really aggressive trades with, with this wave, but they're obviously afraid of a gank happening, so... Oh my goodness, look at that burst damage. The Ignite goes down, there's the Curtain Call. Mako nice gets bubble. the bubble to cancel it, and in comes Clear Love. Can he find the Q is the question. They want the easy kill. There's the kick. The Q is going to go for it after the, the flash, but it isn't quite enough. Deadly Flourish on Mako. He's taking a lot of damage from the minions. Oh my goodness, the grenade. Not enough. The uh, Evan Floyd gets him back to health. I'm not sure I really like the way Thrilla played that. I think uh, his decision not to go for some kind of flash play or even shoot the Q out after he, he sent the kick, it, it was really weird to to see how he, how he played that. I think if they played that cleaner, he should have been able to get a kill. Yeah, but like I was explaining right before the gank happened, I was saying they shouldn't be afraid of the gank, but as you, well, as I said, the more aggressive you can play with the wave, the better trades you can take. And as you saw, Deft was getting extremely low, but obviously that was just them trying to pull up the gank. Oh, there's the wave. Gorilla takes a lot of damage. Clearly flashes the flourish. His peanuts now looking for some kills. The heal comes out. Deft. Very, very low. The flash in from Prey. So much damage. And a double kill comes through. Clear Love gets destroyed. And that is a triple kill cleanup from Peanut. And Koro can't do anything. Smeb is even able to get down the slicing Maelstrom. Kuro comes in for some last desserts. Gets himself an assist. I mean, that's that so rough. That, that just felt like it was forcing a little bit too hard. I think EDG just assumed with the vision control that they had that they could go for this. But Peanut was sitting in lane behind them and was able to basically counter this gank and, and, and the Olaf got started and just didn't get stopped. Yeah, so much damage. Peanut just is gonna be so huge now. 
It felt like they just pulled the trigger, but they weren't really too calculating about what they were going to do. They just kind of pulled the trigger, but there's not much for them to do. They kind of TP'd in and just walked away and died. I, th I think it was the kind of thing where they're like, all right, Karma has no flash, and we have good vision control in the river. We can just force this really hard, and uh, they can't. Because, like I said, you know, Kunesh just sitting behind there waiting for them to start that fight off, and as soon as he saw uh, Clear Love again, he just can, can go in for free, basically. Uh, I, I can't say I hate the idea of what EDG wanted, but it was just countered really well by Rox, and then the Rise obviously just getting down there first, because uh, a lot of Rox was really low, so if Jace was ahead on the push and was able to get to that play first, maybe he can help turn it with Koro, uh, but it just couldn't work out. Yeah, something I noticed is that Prey in did end up dying, so there's not a whole lot of advantage gained for the 2v2, so you'll see that the EDG bot lane will still be able to pressure, still be able to get a lot of poke down, and that's the same. Yeah. It's really just up to Ooh. death not taking too horrible trades because you can't out sustain getting getting killed. Yeah. yeah. Can't out sustain death. Yeah, that's a tough one. We'll see whether he can turn that one around because you know maybe you'll figure out the answer. So one of the things I like talking about is like positioning in lane and being on the right side and things like that. So uh, we see another potential gank coming in here. Yeah, a trap comes through, but it's a three v three. In goes the tidal wave. I don't think either fifteen could. Actually, oh, with the general, dear. someone could die. Look at the slowdowns Clear here. Is clear love. He's super dead. I don't know what he was doing. He he like ran through a gin trap, walked in circles around on it, took the damage, and then started getting opened up on by by the gin ult. Yeah, he's kind of just dancing around. Pretty sad showing from Clear love. So much hype coming in. Kind of so sad to see jungle. it. Not quite showing his undefeated progress. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's been talk about Dada awards everywhere. I think the clue is certainly getting up there. Mm -hmm. As far as being delivered that one. So what I was talking about right before that that kind of happened was just the positioning in lane in terms of like what side supports and AD carries stand on. Uh, I'll ask Matt's thoughts oh, yeah. on it. So the way you want to position in lane, it usually comes down to the strength. So the most obvious one is a range versus melee matchup. So the melee. Uh, they want to avoid the range support. They want to put themselves into a position where they can take free damage and they can apply as much pressure as they can. So in this position, uh, it's kind of hard because it's a Nami, but the way Karma needs to position is basically be able to trade with the Jin and position yourself uh, against from the Nami. So you basically have to coordinate your trading and never trade alone. Aha. Uh -huh. It really just comes down to, is the support matchup able to win, and is the AD carry matchup able to win? So for Kaelin and Nami, uh, the Karma beats the Nami, but then the, the Kaelin beats the Jin and the Karma. So the f most favorable position would be the, the Karma matching up uh, alongside, basically being adjacent with the Nami, and taking trades together with the Jin. So some of those tips for you solo viewers out there who are listening, this is one of the things people tend to get wrong, as we see a gank coming in onto Smeb. Yeah, and I have a feeling that he's in trouble. Even no if flash. the Q does miss, Peacemaker's going to come down and Deft is going to clean that one up and now look for this top outer turret. It seems like a lot of miscommunication or maybe just uh, lack of awareness, knowing that uh, they just recalled and a, a pretty solid play to pull off is just put your bot lane top and take a free tower. Yeah, this, I think this was a really good play for them because th they were losing in the top side. Um, the, you can just see that Core was down a decent amount of CS, so getting him out of that landing phase, opening the map up, getting some turrets and global gold for your team. They're definitely a team that wants a couple items. They can't rely on, on base stats and things like that. I feel like this is just really sloppy from Rox. Just giving up that death, giving up two free towers, really just gives back a ton of gold, and they're already even again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're going to be able to get this bottom turret, but it's not going to be nearly enough as we see a, a very interesting gank attempt on to, to scout in mid. Yeah, the run wall going to come through, but that tower is very, very healthy. They do manage to trade the bottom out of turret, but first turret blood and an extra turret towards the top side of the map for EDG. No so they certainly come out on, on top. A thousand gold behind still after that first early catastrophe for EDG's bottom lane. So just to talk a little bit about the comp and why that early game is so bad for them. Uh, when you're the poke comp, you want to be able to actually threaten the front line with your poke. So not just like, oh, if we land a Jace EQ onto Smeb and Prey, it's really bad. But you want it to be bad for the, the Olaf too. But the problem is with Olaf picking up four kills is he's going to be so tanky in the mid game that like he, he probably won't be super worried about the damage that EDG can throw in at him when they're fighting around vision control for objectives and stuff like that moving forward. So. A little ambitious. I mean, Core 1 decided to hold the champions there, so that was a good step, but I'm not <laughs> too sure about that one. Yeah, odd maneuver. 
Gorilla still did take, you know, a large amount of poke there from Scout. Building towards his, uh... How did I forget? More of Malmordius. What the heck? The Ma of Malmordius. He got distracted by the tier, not used to seeing Jace's go it. It's okay. Hey, they haven't been building it for quite some time. Yeah, not as, it's it's still a little bit more common on the mid lane Jaces, not so much in the, the top yeah, I mean, lane I think ones. that's a pretty good build. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Uh, but the thing I was pointing out was like, look at Olaf. He already is like close to finishing his Randuin's Omen, and you see zero armor pen, even like really close to it on the side of EDG. Like, sure, Jace will finish his Maw pretty soon, but that's not going to be nearly enough to get through him. And if he's just like running straight at you, you're terrified of him because he's almost pushing 3k HP already. It's, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. he's going to get so tanky so quickly. And like, if, if you're at a 20 minute Baron or Dragon fight, like, who's really going to contest him? You don't have much pick off CC. You you only have your bubble, and so who's gonna stop? And him? he just presses Ragnarok anyway and just runs into the back line. Yeah, and I mean even just like not in just the fight, but like fighting for vision. You put a Karma Shield on him and he runs forward. How are you gonna hit this guy? He's just gonna hit clear wards in front of your face, and I think Rox is gonna have a really easy time controlling uh, objectives from here on. So I think slowing down the game for them is, is a decent idea. Now you can notice the lane assignment. What the well actually both teams want to do is just enter one through one and kind of just. Uh, let the solo matchups get their advantages. I don't think there's any clear uh, winner for the bot side. Maybe Ryze outpushes Jace, as I just saw uh, the Ryze get a little priority. But for Rocks or EDG to get advantage, they want to be setting up 1-3-1, one, one, invading the jungle together as the jungle and support, and getting vision around whatever objective they want to play for. So right now, Dragon's going to spawn in a minute 15. Uh, not too much uh, worry for Rox's vision, since they already have four wards in the Dragon side. And yeah, it's pretty much just setting up this next next dragon. The vision will still be there as the dragon spawns, but as the dragon will stay up, if it's not immediately contested, it loses it on that vision. Well, 56 seconds until that one is an option. Yeah, so you can sort of tell who's in control of this game since Rox is being able to push up mid and the side lanes whenever they want. And being able to dictate the pace of the game really shows who's in control of the game. And that's Rox. And what they're going to be looking for in the next about a minute after they control whatever they want topside. Maybe they want Rift Herald on somebody, not too sure what. The, oh, they're going for a topside. That's what they're going for. Well, there's the curtain call as Kari is going to flash out of the way. Some flashes really to follow him. Clear oh, is going yes. to turn up, and now they're caught in an interesting position, but it's still a 4v5. Peanut gets himself amongst it, and you mentioned he's difficult to kill. Yeah. Throws down the ultimate, gets himself amongst it, and saves the rest of his team. It's a one for nothing in favor of Rox. Yeah, that was really well played. That was actually a little ballsy to do that since they didn't have much vision control at the top side. They kind of did that not blindly since they saw people clearing mid, but they knew that they had this little small window where they'll be able to just rush down Rumble and just make a clean escape. And really important too was the fact that Rumble's ult was down. When I initially saw that dive, it, it looked like it could have gone really bad for Rox, but once you realize that uh, Koro doesn't have his ult, it's a lot safer to go for because you're not going to worry about getting stuck on top of a turret with a Rumble ult burning you down because EDG was there to punish it if if they could have had that up and it could have got really bad for them, but Rox was just a step ahead and obviously communicating what abilities are up very well. Yeah, it was Ow. a pretty cool play to do. I mean, there was not much obje objectives to really play for since Dragon wasn't really spawning, so pretty cool play to do until Dragon spawned. The Dragon is now going to be available. Wave is actually building up on the bottom side of the map for Rox. You saw them pinging a little bit earlier on. We'll see who's going to head down there. But Scout should easily be able to clear this one out. Cloud Drake, baby. Yeah, that's the dream. And he loves talking about Cloud Drake. I just love Cloud Drake. Man. I mean, I like any dragon. To be honest, it's all about that dragon buff when Elder comes around. Mm -hmm. It is nice. I have a slight favoritism for the uh, Mountain Drake. Really? You're yeah. a mountain man? Fire, man. fire is all. Mark Z, the Mountain Man. Mm hmm. Sounds like an alliteration that I could get amongst Mark Z. I just uh, I value it so highly when when you're in these like vision control struggles and it just makes it so much harder for the team that's behind to calculate how much of a threat there is on on the Baron. It goes yeah, down prefer, so much faster. I prefer fire dragons, but if there's a, the, the difference between three fires and three mountains, I'd actually prefer the three mountains. Because right. Especially if your team comes like an objective control, then it basically limits the amount of time the enemy has to be able to check Baron or walk and contest. So also means mountains, that you can. Three man Baron so so easily. Well, yeah, as I well. mean, three mountains turns the amount of time that an enemy has to react from 12 seconds down to like eight seconds or seven seconds, which is very hard to deal with because having that low amount of time that you have to react pretty much gives the the ability to control vision and the ability to get picks goes up immensely. And and one of the things about Baron uh, like damage is I think people overestimate like 
how easy it is to know if it if it like you can get it or not. Like there's a lot of times where a Baron call looks really bad in hindsight, but at the time if they did it, you know, half a second faster, it's a great call. And it's it's one of those things with why that mountain drake is so important because it just makes all those calls so much safer and easier. Ooh, Death gets rooted under the turret. This, this is going to be a problem really here as he gets himself out of the way. Mako protecting his AD carry. Oh my goodness, that was almost the bent bullet. The last one, not going to find it as Prey looking for a flourish. Cheeky auto attack on the turret. Heroic's really being yet. able to cement their uh, mid lane dominance with their bot lane. Just having the ability to just shove up mid lane whenever you want, being able to use your... They were just sitting in fog using all their skill shots, having the gym long range. That's really just what it what it's about in competitive play, being able to have the mid lane dominance and translating that mid lane dominance into, yeah, vision control, objective control, and setting up the team plays. Yeah, it's so hard for EDG to play. We saw five people grouped up mid versus the three of oh, rocks. Yeah, the Axe almost stole was it, but he, he whacked it out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> that was so close. I wonder whether he was doing it for damage or whether he knew that the other no, was no coming. No, no way he knew that was coming. He was just doing it for damage. <laughs> I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Looked cool. It's peanut. No, that's not going to work. Actually, wait, maybe he did. That's actually pretty obvious. So I think that's that's definitely something that he was thinking about. Nice, good. Makes it makes him sound smarter as well. It's definitely better, regardless of whether we know exactly whether or not he ch chose to do it uh, on purpose or not. Now I'm not too experienced normal builds, but I feel like he built the wrong item. Like building Leonji's first instead of Proto Belt seems like the wrong. Actually, um, I feel like if you're a battle rumble, belt. you go for the proto belt. But if you're a Koro rumble that just wants to sit back, throw down some Actually, equalizers. Yeah, I, I'm not too sure, but maybe proto's better. Maybe Leandre's better. I mean, definitely for the damaging whole off, Leandre's is better. So I don't uh, yeah. think it's a bad build at all. I, th I think Leandre's is, is probably fine here. You're against a relatively low range comp. Rise isn't super long range. Olaf obviously isn't. Kennen as well. The only really long range one is the, the Jin. And it would be nice to be able to proto belt at his face and force him off his ultimate. But I think that's a secondary concern to Ooh, being able to kill people. This is a no-no for supports. Being able to ward doesn't oh. come from you just walking in by yourself. You need your teammates. Speaking of walking in by yourself, and Peanut's going to do exactly like that. <laughs> And uh, that is going to be fish stew. That's a lesson many supports have learned and will continue to learn. Learn do the hard way. Work. Yeah, do not work yeah. by Learn by doing is uh, my method. Worst part of it all is probably not just the kill, but losing their TP as well. As yeah, we very, see. Very, very sloppy. Yeah, death. Oh, oh my goodness. So much flash. damage. As Smeb's going to be able to launch his way in there. Scout as well, taking a lot of damage off the back end. Good Zonya's there from Smeb. Oh my goodness, He's the snipe it. onto the Jace. There's some of that explosive, uh, explosive mid game that Rock seems to have. They they get one kill in the top side, transition to mid, get a pick off under the turret, get a dive, and now they're going to be taking another one in the top side. Yeah, they'll be up about seven k gold after this one. Pretty unfortunate, and I think a lot of it just kind of stemmed from the Nami getting cut. Everybody is sort of being out of position. Really unfortunate that see here, they're, like EDG doesn't really have any reason to be up at all, and I mean that was actually really well timed by Prey, but. Completely unnecessary for EDG to beat up that point. Yeah. That was like precise timing there, though. Gotta give it to Prey. That was insanely well timed. Feels like this game is, is basically out of control for EDG. Their comp really doesn't play that well from behind. Uh, I'm not sure if Rox has demonstrated the kind of uh, restraint that we've seen out of SKT when they're vision controlling uh, objectives, but. Even still, it's so hard for have anyone, to have anyone face check to, to try and get vision control back. I mean, Lee Sin's very mobile, but uh, he's, he's not tanky at all, going warrior first compared to an Olaf or any any real tank. So if he ever just gets his root, gets rooted by Prey or anything like that, he's going to go down so quickly. Yeah, this game's going to be a struggle for ADG, but I wouldn't count them out completely because I feel like Rox is more of a ballsy team. They like to do kind of crazy plays when they're ahead, and I think this could be one of those games where they might you know, throw the game, might go really ambitious, and even if they trade, like a 3 for 3 team fight, that's actually really beneficial for EDG. Yeah. So, for Rocks to win, I really don't, uh, I really hope they don't just, you know, kind of suicide team fight. The thing that's scary, though, is what Mark brought up earlier on, which is the fact that EDG are playing something very reminiscent of a poke star composition with not a whole lot of tanky members. So, falling behind just does feel very dangerous. And I really love the optimism, Matt. But <laughs> I just, I'm finding it difficult to believe at this stage 
Yeah, it's not just the tankiness, it's the CC as well, where you basically have one hard CC in a Nami bubble, and that is super hard to land just on its own, as we see Mako getting caught out again. I certainly don't have a Nami bubble working. anymore. Losing support life, not very fun. Yeah. He just wanted to grab some vision on that Baron. Didn't have any more of those scrying orbs left. Yeah, and kind of I touched on it when I was talking about Madden Dragons, but this is the sort of timing window that uh, EDG has to deal with now. They have to, within a time limit, check there. Oh, and make sure that there's the flash yeah, from Crow. Yeah, gets the Room things. Prism. A fair bit of money goes, uh, sorry, damage goes back, but Gorilla just zoning away the rumble. Clear Love trying to escape. He's going to do so as he ward hops his way out. Deft is still alive, but rocks. They grab two easy picks. One after the other. Yeah, no, now they're back on the timer then. They have to check it within, you know, 10 seconds. Otherwise, that's a gone Baron. I think they might Peanut's just... Peanut's legendary as well. Yeah, it's just it's already gone. We've got to concede it. I mean, Queer Love had to recall. It's not even going to bother going out and trying to push out the bot wave in anticipation of the inevitable siege coming. Yeah, they couldn't really contest this, so... Just got to move it up. Not happening. So At least they're trading. They traded Baron for an air dragon. <clears throat> Better than no dragon. Yeah, better than nothing. And they get a full wave on the bot side of the map. So, big deal. Well, Very important maybe not a big deal, but you may as well get something. Yeah, exactly right. You were talking about trading being important. Yeah, whenever you're behind, you just got to trade stuff, even if it's <laughs> not very fair trades, like you're getting bullied by. <laughs> like, if you're a little kid trying to trade his, like, lollipop for, you know, like a candy bar, he's being bullied. That's just the kind of trades you got to take. Yep. You take the paper clip. He takes your lunch. Exactly. Yeah. Well, otherwise, you don't even get a paperclip. Yeah, right? yeah. You, you get a punch in the face. Something, something like that. <laughs> if you want your lollipop, you just got to take it. You got to give up your candy Problem bar. solving with Atlas. Yeah. Like if you want to fight for it, you're going to get a black eye, too. So yeah. it's just not <laughs> even The guy taking your lollipop is way bigger than you. Yep. Oh, goodness. I'm getting flashbacks now, gentlemen. We're going to have to change the subject. Can we look to Twitter for that? I think we certainly can. Uh, Rodrigo Marino. Uh, to get priority means to get the lane pushing. Is that what you mean oh, by yeah, saying getting priority? It. Yeah, priority is basically the blanket term for being able to push in the wave, you know, the six minions or, you know, the seven minions when there's a CH creep. And basically, uh, there's like a timing window until you have to return to lane. So during that timing, when you're out of lane, is what priority means. Since it means that the enemy has to sit under tower, clear all those creeps, and finally they're available to, you know, Kind of return into the action. So during that, you know, 20 to 30 second window, if you have super priority, you can do plays like roaming to bot tower, roaming to top tower, uh, maybe even finding the jungle, uh, the jungler in his jungle, or yeah, trying to set the TP play or something like that. Yeah, and you don't need to use priority in like huge ways every time where you're making a monster play. You can use priority to get vision control, uh, go steal away yeah, like small wraiths, wraiths, really small stuff. Anytime that you can push in the enemy, just go for a very small safe micro advantage. Yeah, being or really technical, it's all about the small objectives, like even just one CS on a small Wraith camp, that's a small objective, but it's all things that you can take with priority. It all adds up in the end. Thank you very much for set shedding some light, gentlemen. I think as this siege is going to continue, uh, we will break off if there is anything that is going to break out. In fact, Ross that should be able to break, break open the base. Exactly right. Death moves out of the way of the Deadly Flourish. Undertow is going to land, but now the inhibitor has been exposed. Spamp still waiting. He does have his flash. He does have the slicing maelstrom. Rocks are setting themselves up if they can. They've got Kuro down towards the bottom side. Koro, speaking of names that are similar, is going to get caught by the Undertow in the Rune Prison. Sorry, yeah. no, not the Rune Prison, just the Undertow. It's just so hard for EDG to stop them from mowing down these objectives. I mean, what what is like Rocks really scared of a Nami bubble? I mean, that's that's really the one catch-out tool that you're worried about. Maybe some crazy insect play out of Clear Love uh, and some poke. It's, it's not nearly as threatening as when there's like an Ori ball at your feet or or an Elise shooting cocoons at you. There's really not much to be scared of as we see Smep jump Snap. into the back. Well, he does not look scared at all, Mark Z, as Death taking a fair bit of damage. No Thundering Shuriken to land though from Smeb. That yeah, is going to secure effect, two though. inhibitors. And EDG just look like they have no idea how to respond. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically donezo from here. We're going to see Rox probably just go for a quick reset and then head up to the top side, trying to get the third inhib. Knowing EDG, they'll probably go for some kind of crazy engage on that last one. That's the dream. I hope so. Go out in a blaze of glory. Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot to talk about for itemization. I mean, it's worth noting Prey doesn't have boots yet, which is a little greedy. He just wants to build as much damage as he wants, which I don't think is that bad when you have a Karma. So building no boots, uh, it's, it's okay. But... Everything else is pretty standard, you know, the locket, very necessary in support. 
And yeah, always finish your secrets first. You get a lot of gold from finishing your sightstone item on the AP supports. Well, Matt, we've got a, a few extra, uh, I guess, more teaching type questions. You have been very, very good at those, so I want to go back to it. I don't know whether you've had much experience playing Jin, but Tom does have a question. What is the best way to CS as Jin under tower with the reload mechanic and slow auto attacks? Uh, Jin's not the best uh, 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 under tower CSer, but he's still fine. You just have to save your Q for the last hits that you can't really hit, so don't waste your Q. Uh, it's just. You have to always use your, uh, you know, your normal auto attacks to last it, and when you can't possibly do it, like when you reload, that's when you use your Q. So All don't right. use your Q first. That's bad. And Dancing grenade thing. whilst you reload. And it's also your W too. So when you can't use your Q, then you use your W, and vice versa. It's basically just knowing how your dancing grenade is going to interact with the creeps. Is it going to clear all of them, or is it going to leave them too low? Do I have to use my W? It's just you kind of have to think about all those things when last thing in the tower. Is it one of those things that's uh, easy for support to help out with? Because I know that's uh, that's one of the big things for other AD carries is having the yeah, you supports know, always prep the back line. Yeah, I need to prep for the AD carry. Uh, for Jin, it's really easy because usually has you know so much AD on its own. For some AD carries, when it gets to like the level six, level seven, usually they need one little last hit on the the range creeps. But for Jin, he can always just auto attack it. So make sure you don't. Uh, like mess it up for them and all. Like maybe if you use your auto attacks on the range creeps, it won't allow them to queue it. So don't be too worried about prepping Jin. He's mostly going to be self-sufficient. But yeah, for the rest of the AD carries, for sure, the support needs to prep yep. when needed. Got to do your job underneath that turret supports. Yeah, it's definitely a skill you need to learn if you want to be a support man. Oh, oh, oh my He's going to get snap into the oh. back line. Oh my god, it's a bloodbath. Double kill comes out. Kuro's going to pick up one as Peanut is looking ridiculous. That's 10 kills. Smith grabs another one. <laughs> Zonyas is their scout. Hunts Peanut back oh, in, exactly. but he gets the heal. Stays alive somehow, and Scout has to watch his base in tatters. EDG, this was a schooling from Rox this time around. They are looking so, so dominant. This game was basically playtime's over. No more Fiora, no more fun. Just crush him. Absolutely not. And Scout says, well, I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory, exactly like what you were talking about, Mark Z. And the Nexus is going to do exactly the same thing. EDG, they come back in game number three. But it's all over game four. And the Rox Tigers show exactly why they're the champions of Korea. Right, it's a great game. Uh, we had the bot lane focus. We were able to see how this game actually broke open so poorly for yeah. uh, EDG. They over-focused and forced around the bot side, and Rox was prepared to punish it. Yep. It didn't really come down to the duo as much as just where the, the action happened. It just all happened in bot lane. Uh, Prey or Gorilla didn't really cement their own lead in their lane, but that's where all the action happened. That's where the game really just exploded, and it led to an 11 kill off. Yeah, and it actually felt like Prey was going back to this full utility AD carry style. He was facilitating a gigantic peanut who was just running around the map mowing people down. 11-0-5 in the end of that game. 100% kill participation by the final seconds the of the game. Just that is just ridiculous. And it's really, really cool that Rox can identify the fact that they have a lead so, so early on. He was 4-0-1 coming out of like seven minutes into the game. They see that and then they play around that from the get-go. They weren't trying to have Prey be this massive carry. Smeb was being this flanking player, but it was all about Peanut, the fact that he could just penetrate any back line ever. Yeah, it, it seemed like they had a lot of confidence. Sorry to cut you off. But for bot lane, uh, it really looked like Rox was in control of what they what they were doing. They baited in EDG yeah. to go on for whatever games, and none of them worked out for EDG. It was something we had seen over the course of the series where Peanut was often seen sitting behind his laners, ready to counter gank, and this was one of the first times it paid off in a really big way where EDG tries to go for a really heavy force regank after getting Karma Summoners out, and then Olaf is just there ready to counter it. Yeah, that's just too scary. And was a whole lot of that coming down to Rock's understanding that Lee Sin needs to get work done early, so Peanut knowing that all he does need to do is really counter gank, so hanging out towards the bottom side of the map when they're lacking summoner spells. Is that all just intelligent play from Rox? Yeah, I think Peanut just completely outplayed Claire Love. He just knew what he was doing. He had all the counter plays ready, and yeah, I think he really just carried his team to victory. Yeah. And on Clear Love's side, he did kind of need to make plays, because I think if you're going into the mid game, even it, it's harder to play their comp. You have to be super worried about TP flanks. You have to be worried about yeah. uh, anyone getting caught out of position. If you're just in range for like a flash, 
rise root or his alt flank. Like there's so many ways that you can get abused, and if you're from behind, it's hard to fight for vision control. So I think I understand Clearo's mindset of trying to force plays, but it was just a little too predictable. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Is there something that Klilov can then do to try and mix it up? Does he then have to go top lane? Does he try to force ganks mid lane, something like that instead? Or is it just you have to be there, you have to try, and you have to hope that Peanut's doing something else? Maybe uh, get extra go, vision or home, something? Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Well, in Brutal. fact, it's exactly what he home, does so have to do because EDG are that. now out of the of the finals run. I'm, I'm trying not to cry, but I'm, I'm <laughs> doing okay. You want to the show moment. the stream what you got? No. No, you're going to hide no. it? No, I was wearing my EDG shirt underneath my shirt, but it's just it's not the time. We can't do that now. It's okay. It was a Game 5 thing. We never made it to Game 5, ladies and gentlemen. Atlas's dreams are crushed. Welcome to the NA side. We've been here for a little while. Oh, yes. Oh, finally. The I Chinese can join region you guys. can join yeah. us. Yep. Because you guys were, you know, saying that, well, at least one of your teams is still in, but nope, not anymore. So <laughs> thankfully now I can find friends and I'm in the right country. So everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. But going back to the game, I mean, Rocks Tigers played a phenomenal games one and two. Looking forward. They're going to have to go up against SKT. We've seen this one over and over again. Regular season looks good for Rocks, but is the new form of Worlds SKT going to be able to take them down? Uh, I'm not sure. I think there's two very different clear play styles here where uh, Rox is a lot more explosive and they're willing to take risks and do crazy stuff. And SKT is like the definition of like controlled macro gameplay where they'll just like bait Baron 15 times over the course of 10 yep. minutes and finally get it on you. And I, I'm really interested, uh, interested to see how it plays out. Yeah, it'll definitely be like a clash in styles. So for... The Rocks and SKT matchup, I think it could go either way very easily because Rocks can do that really unexpected and explosive play that just blows the game open. Otherwise, it'll be SKT slowly choking them out and not really giving anything up. And where are you looking as far as like lane dominant uh, power points here for both of these teams? I mean, you of course draw your eyes to, to Faker, but is Smeb going to be able to take advantage of Duke? Is Peanut going to be a big deal here in this matchup? I think Peanut's the big one to look at. Uh, SKT's junglers, though they were better in the series that just played versus RNG, have looked shaky over the course of the, the regular season playoffs and, and a little bit in the group stage. So I think there's a concern there that Peanut starts running them over with like the Olaf pick that we saw here. That was super high priority in that series. So I think uh, that's going to be the biggest mismatch, though uh, mid lane, Kuro always plays like this different style than Faker, but Faker obviously much stronger individually. I mean, just yeah. the fact that there's two junglers for SKT and only one jungler for EDG, it's, I mean, not EDG. <laughs> well, EDG Rocks. also has one, Rocks. but Rox yeah, yeah, as well. It really shows that SKT's jungler is sort of the weak point. If we were to like try to find a weak point, I'd say. And the strong point for Rox is for sure Peanut. So. That'll be the contrast and maybe where Rocks will get their advantages. Yeah, well, we'll see exactly what happens. That is going to be next week. But join us here again tomorrow when Gate returns to the show for another full day of alternate takes on the quarterfinals in Chicago. For tomorrow's series between H2K and Albus Knox Luna, we'll take a look at the bottom lane matchup as well as dives into the mid lane and jungle. But that's all from us here on the Player Experience stream. For myself, everyone here who helped bring you the cast, thank you for joining us. Now we'll hand you back to the mainstream for an interview with the Rocks Tigers pray to close out the day.